Good evening. This is October 16th of 2024. My name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. We're in the book of Luke. Uh, as I've said many times, um, Luke focuses on the last six months of Jesus's ministry. He taught for three and a half years, three full years, and then six more months from October to Passover in March. So, um, uh, Jesus is mostly preaching to the Pharisees and warning people that the last days are coming, the last days of Jerusalem's existence as they know it. So in Luke chapter 12, um, as usual, there's a group of the 12 apostles are there. Many of the 70 disciples are there. They're just Onlookers are there, and they're also Pharisees and Sadducees all in the crowd when Jesus is talking. So uh, uh, I just remind us of a few things that he said, because there's this passage coming up that people, to me, misinterpret. And I think if you just read it in context, it makes perfectly sense. So it's interesting to me that people don't misinterpret this passage coming up. But anyway, so in Luke 12, verse 10, Jesus has said, Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man... It will be forgiven him but to him who blasphemes against the holy spirit it will not be forgiven you go well what's the difference between speaking against jesus and speaking against the holy spirit and he's saying anyone who misunderstands who the son of man is uh and that's christ referring to his humanness uh like peter who says i don't know him i'm denying him that's one thing when you don't recognize who jesus is and you say oh jesus he's just a man and but at a certain point in everyone's life, basically everyone, God reveals himself as God in some way. Uh, obviously, if you're on a desert island somewhere, you have a revelation and you, you, know, you have no contact with the Bible or anything like that. You have a revelation that there's a God who built this universe. And you can either say, nah, I believe that the universe just popped out of nowhere. And I don't believe there's a God in shut it off but the holy spirit gave you a revelation and that you either choose to accept or not for those of us who've heard the gospel and we're not on some desert island somewhere there's a point in everyone's life when some miracle happens or something happens that they cannot explain and they can choose to believe that there's god there's choose to believe that there's a jesus that, that there's you know that it's real and that's the holy spirit revealing that to them or they can reject it and so that's when you're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. When you know that you know that you know you had some sort of encounter with God or with something supernatural or, or Jesus was made real to you and you're rejecting it on purpose. You know what you're doing, which is different than like Peter when he was running away from Jesus. He thought, oh, no, this is Jesus. Is, he turns out he's just a man. And then that, right. But, but when Christ appears to him, his resurrected now he knows oh this is the actual son of god and at that point he can either choose to go along with her saying yeah i don't want to believe it and so jesus separates that from speaking word against the son of man where you don't really know what you're talking about ah, i don't believe in christ i don't believe this christianity stuff and you're just rejecting religion and then blaspheming the holy spirit is that moment when the holy spirit has made real to you who jesus is and you still are rejecting it, and you know what you're rejecting, and you just don't want it. The Pharisees were in that position right then. Jesus has opened blinded eyes, he's opened deaf ears, he's walked on water. They know that, the, that they're rejecting the Messiah, that, that what they are seeing only God could have done. They know that at that point. The Holy Spirit has revealed that to them, and Jesus is warning them, judgment day is coming, and you're going to be judged for your rejection of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 54, in that same chapter, he says to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately say, oh, a shower is coming. And you're right. He says, and so it is. So he says, you're able to judge the weather. He says, and when you see the south wind blow and you say, oh, there will be a hot weather. And, and there it is. And he says, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not dis discern this time? Why can't you tell 
that the Messiah has come to your midst. This is something you've been waiting for for 1,200 years since you got back here into this land. Since you left Egypt and you were brought back, you've been waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And now I'm doing all the things, all the things that were prophesied. That's why there's over five or 600 prophecies of the Messiah. I'm fulfilling all of them. And yet you're saying, oh, I wonder when the Messiah is going to show up. So you can tell when it's going to rain, but you can't tell that this is now the time of, of the visitation of God. He says, you're being hypocritical. Everything that you were told was supposed to happen is happening, and you're just choosing to reject it. So judgment is coming your way. So if you had moral discernment, you would, you would know that judgment day was at hand. And understand that what you're supposed to, this is what he's telling you, and understand that your duty right now is to reconcile with God, is to recognize what's in front of you and make peace with what's going on right now. So he says to them in Luke chapter 12, verse 57, because that's everything leading up to this. He's saying now is the time. Now is that you should be able to recognize what, and you better make peace with what's going on or you're going to get in trouble. He says, yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? So why can't you discern what is right? It's right in front of your face. And so here's the next thing that people, for some reason, Jesus think that Jesus is changing the subject, but he's not. He says, for when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, you make every effort along the way to settle with him. Like, you know, like, uh-oh, I'm about to get in trouble. So the, the person who knows the truth my adversary is, is taking me before the judge and saying, this person has wronged me in whatever way, or this person owes me money, or whatever the problem is, you're now being taken before the judge. And he says, you know to make every effort along the way to settle with him so that when you get before the judge, the judge can wash his hands and say, okay, I'm done, everything's settled, I don't have to send you to jail, you've made peace. So he says, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, you make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. And I tell you, you should not depart from there till you've paid the very last mite. So, so, you, know, so you know that you're going to be sent in jail and ultimately have to pay for your crime. So that's how you do normal in your secular life. And Jesus is therefore saying, you better do that now because the judge of the earth you're going to have to stand before him. And this is the time now to make peace. So uh, he's saying, be as wise concerning your own soul as you are in these regular monetary things that you deal with every day. In John chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus says, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. And that it says, it's Moses, in whom you trust. Because Moses gave the law, right? And, 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 and Moses saying, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, all this stuff. And so that's who you have to contend with. And you know that you can't contend. And so here I am offering a different way. Because he says, if you believed Moses, you would believe in me. For he wrote about me. Knowing that you could not fulfill the law, he wrote about this redeemer who's to come, this comforter who's to come, who, who will fulfill the law. So you're going to be held accountable by the law itself. That's your adversary. He says, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the adversary they're facing is the law. It's, it's, it's the, um, the thing that's going to, they're going to, the standard they're going to be held to when they stand before the judge. The judge is going to say, guilty. Well, Jesus isn't offering us a way out. He's saying, believe in me. And therefore, when you stand before the judge, he won't say guilty. He'll say innocent because you'll be covered with my blood. So make peace along the way now with what I am saying before you have to stand before the judge. Now, Luke chapter 13, verse 1. He says, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So again, Galilee is up in the north. That's where Jesus got most of his disciples. They are very not religious up there. Down south in Jerusalem, all the Pharisees, Sadducees, the, all the scribes, they're very religious down there. Now they're evil in their heart, but the, outwardly they're very religious. Up north, crazy town. Mm -hmm. 
they're just doing whatever they want up north. Um, and so, but that's ironically where Jesus got his disciples. And those people were more willing to hear Jesus because they knew they were sinners. They knew they were a mess. So some people told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So apparently some of the Galileans had gone um, and before some altar up north and were giving a sacrifice and Pilate had come in and killed them. Not that Pilate made a sacrifice, but while they were making sacrifices, he killed them and their blood mingled with their sacrifices. So Pilate knew that they would be in the synagogue up there or that they would be doing their sacrifices and Pilate took advantage of that. Uh, in Luke chapter 23, verse 5, it says, uh, he stirs up the people, teaching, they're talking about Jesus, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. So they're, they're warning people against this Jesus. He started up north in Galilee and came all the way down to Jerusalem, and he's stirring up the people. Uh, now, verse 6 of verse, uh, Luke 23 says, Now when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were Galilean. So Jesus is standing before Pilate at this point. Oh, Galilee, uh, is this man a Galilean? And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. So they sent Jesus to Pilate because he was the governor. He was a representative from Rome who's kind of just overseeing that area. He's the overseer. But when he heard that he was a Galilean, he says, I'm going to send him back to, to Herod. Herod, that's his jurisdiction. I have no, no jurisdiction over Galilee. So it's interesting that Pilate had sent some of his eh, ninja up there to kill these Galileans. That was not his jurisdiction. He had no business sending people up there. That was Herod's jurisdiction. And so it, it goes on to say in Luke chapter 23, as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him and he'd hoped to see some miracles done by him. So Herod had always heard about this Jesus. In fact, Herod had thought that Jesus was really John the Baptist risen from the dead, and he felt guilty because his daughter Salome had asked for the head of John the Baptist, and he had told her, girl, anything you want, I'll give you. And so now he's thinking, John the Baptist has come back from the dead in the form of Jesus to taunt me. And so I want to see him and make peace with him. So Pilate sends him to Herod. And it says in verse 12, that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other. For previously, they had been at enmity with each other. So we're assuming that the reason that Pilate and Herod were mad at each other is because Pilate had sent people into Galilee, which was Herod's territory, and killed a bunch of people while they were doing sacrifices. So this was Pilate's gift to Herod. Here's Jesus. You've been wanting to see Jesus? Here, I'm sending him to you. So anyway, they're telling Jesus, hey, there are these Galileans who Pilate had killed. Now, here's a reason probably that Pilate had these people killed. Uh, they probably were very zealous. Everyone in Israel hated the Romans and hated that the Romans were ruling over them. And some were quite zealous, including Judas of Iscariot. We've got to do something about these Romans. So probably some group had been plotting to overthrow Pilate, and Pilate heard about it and sent them and, and, and had them killed. In Acts chapter 5, verse 36, after Jesus has been resurrected, the Pharisees are talking about a similar situation to this. He said, and one of the Pharisees says, for some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, and he was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. So they joined him in a rebellion against the Romans. Verse 37 of Acts chapter 5, it says, And after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census. Uh, and, the, and that was earlier during G when... when um, when, what's his name, Mary and Joseph 
uh, had to go to Bethlehem because there was a census. Everybody had to go back to their hometown. There was a census. I think the census happened every 50 years or something like that. J uh, Joseph had to go back to his hometown of Bethlehem, and that's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So he says, after this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away many people after him, and he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So every so often there would be these fake messiahs who would get people to rise up and they would try to overthrow the Roman government and they were always, the rebellion was always quashed. People thought that Jesus was going to do the same thing. He's going to lead a rebellion against Rome. And so, uh, but the little, but, but he didn't obviously, but probably up in Galilee, somebody was trying to get together some rebellion and Pilate heard about them and had them killed. So, they tell Jesus, oh, did you hear what happened to those Galileans? Now, again, they're sinners up in Galilee. The people down north, uh, south, they don't consider themselves sinners, but they were. And Jesus is trying to tell them, you're sinners because you're rejecting me, so you're not any worse than the people up there. But they're asking it, Jesus proceeds to asking it away like, this terrible tragedy that happened to them. Did you hear about them? It happened to them because they're sinners. Because Here's how Jesus answers when, once he tells them about this tragedy in Luke chapter 13, verse 2. It says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Is that, is that your assumption when a group of people suffer some calamity? Is your assumption always, well, they must have been sinning? And that's not true. We can't always assume that that's why. Oh, that person's homeless because they're, they're a bigger sinner than you. Not necessarily. That that uh, city suffered earthquakes and had all that damage because they're bigger sinners than you. Uh, down in Florida, where there's a big hurricane and tornado, they must be terrible sinners, and that's why that happened to them. And that's not necessarily true. So Jesus is saying, is that why you think this tragedy happened to those Galileans, and that they were worse sinners than the other Galileans? He says, no. I tell you no, verse 3 of Luke 13. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I know you think you're holy but you're rejecting me and you're going to have a similar judgment day type of tragedy catastrophe happen to you and he's telling that to the people in and around jerusalem he's, he's warning them because basically 40 years from now this whole place is going to get destroyed the temple's going to get destroyed you're going to have a worse calamity you think that you're such good people but you're rejecting the messiah and so a worse tragedy is going to come on you but he's saying, don't judge that particular tragedy that's happening to them, that, that, that's happening because they're sinners. He said a simpler thing in John chapter 9 when the disciples came to him. It says, his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Like, you know, this person is blind and this person can see, so they must be a terrible sinner. And that's how they're judging. And unfortunately, that is not how it happens. Actually, we all deserve uh, terrible things to happen to us. We're all sinners. God just in his mercy, for whatever reason, spare certain people. But just because tragedy falls on some doesn't mean that there were sinners than others, that God just chooses for whatever reason God chooses. But we can't sit and judge people all the time. Oh, well, you must have done something wrong. No, because Jesus says, uh, neither this man nor his parents sin. That's not why this man was born blind. But God is going to use it for his glory and, he, and, he, and heal this man. So we can't always assume that. Again, we all just deserve judgment, but God in his mercy has spared us through, through Jesus Christ. So because God has been merciful and blessed certain people, it doesn't mean that they're better. Well, ooh, that person's rich. They must be better and purer than that, that sinful person. Nope. Jesus told many parables of the rich man and Lazarus, where this rich man was blessed in his life, but he ended up going to hell. So we, you, we just can't assume when we look at somebody's circumstance that this thing happened to them. Uh, this person who died young must have been a sinner, and this person who lived to be 102, they must be a saint. Well, no, God is just merciful with some people, uh, and we don't know why he chooses. But Jesus is using it to say, but I can tell you for sure that calamity is going to come up you. Judgment will come up on this city because you are currently sinning by rejecting me. So uh, 
he goes on to say in Luke chapter 13, verse 4, or those 18 in whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all of the men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Is that, is, can, can, uh, when, the, when, when somebody's house is blown away, uh, oh, they must have been sinning. No, we can't have that opinion. We can't think that. Uh, God just in his mercy spared these people and uh, allowed the consequences, you know, calamity come in those. But it's not always because, well, you must be worse sinners than somebody else. No. We, we don't know why. I guess when we get to heaven, we'll stand up and say, oh, well, Lord, well, why did you spare this one and that? And he'll, he'll explain his reasoning. But we're not to judge people based on the, con the circumstances of their life because there are plenty of people who are rich and doing well, and they're terrible sinners. And, and, but we want to think that way. We want to think, oh, you can tell who God really likes because they made them rich. No, not necessarily. God may love that poor person and, and, and that poverty may be the very thing that's going to ensure that they make it into heaven. And that riches may not be a blessing for that person. That richness may be a snare, unfortunately, to that, to that rich person and keep them out of heaven because they think, I don't need no God. So we can't always look at the circumstances of this world as far as telling who God loves and who he doesn't love. And, you know, but everybody needs to repent and accept Christ as their savior. That's one thing Jesus is make plain judgment. The one thing that will come on everybody is the final judgment unless you repent in this life. So here's why he speaks his parable in Luke chapter 13, verse six. He says he speaks a parable and says a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. So cut it down. Why does it rise up in the ground? And Jesus is kind of using this as a, a metaphor for his own ministry. He's come to Jerusalem three years in a row. He started out in Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem. It's been three years in a row. Three Passovers in a row. Now, there will be a fourth Passover because there was four and a half years. I mean, three and a half years of his ministry. But three years I've come. And so he's saying judgment is, he's warning that judgment is coming. And that's why he's giving this parable. Now, he's using the fig tree for a, a purpose, for a reason. In Mark chapter 11, so this is a few months from now, uh, he finds a fig tree. And here's what happens. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. It says, now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. Now, if we know, understand how the fig tree works, uh, the first thing that grows after winter on this fig tree are these little tiny figlets. Uh, before there are any leaves on it, just little tiny little figlets on it, and then as they ripen, the leaves then show up around it. And that's the sign that the figs are now ripe is because it has all these leaves. But the fig, figlets grow first and then the leaves grow to let you know there are figs there and that they're ripe. So he sees a fig tree having leaves. So he went to see perhaps he'd find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. So leaves should not be growing when there are no figs. So it's a, it's a, it's a tree that has no purpose. The tree, the purpose of it is to is produce fruit and it's producing nothing, nothing but leaves. So it has no function and it's, it's uh, perverting its purpose. Because it's acting like it's got fruit. It's acting like it's got fruit, but it ain't, ain't got no fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a metaphor for the, the, Pharisees and the Sadducees who are walking around acting like they got this fruit. There's no fruit in their life, but yet they're dressed fine and they're dressed in this way, but there's no fruit. There's no one getting saved. There's no one getting help. There's no one getting delivered. There's no fruit in their lives. And so it's a metaphor uh, for what's going on in Jerusalem and all the poor that are not being helped. And yet they're, my wife's using the word frauds. They are frauds in that they are acting like they're righteous and they have no righteousness. So in response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. And he curses the, 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 the fig tree. 
Next, he goes to Jerusalem. So he finally makes it all the way because he's coming from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and he finds the fig tree and curses it. In Mark 11, verse 15, he says he comes to Jerusalem and then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. Now, this is he'd come to the temple at the first six months of his ministry and he did the same thing. Instead of helping people, they were selling and and making money off of people's misery. And so he he emptied the temple at that time. Three years later, he comes again. Same thing is happening. Well, actually, at this point, it's three and a half years later. So, but he comes again. Nothing is happening, and so no one's being helped. It's all fraud, like my like my, the word my wife is using, which is a good word. So he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry wares to the temple. And then he taught them, saying, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? That's written. Uh, and then there's another verse that says, but you have made it a den of thieves. So he's saying, he's reminding them of what's written. Now, this is written in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, he says to them, has this house, which is called by my name, become a, a, den, of, a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. So he's quoting to them Jeremiah. Was it not written in Jeremiah? This very same thing is happening again, that my house has become a den of thieves. And it goes on in verse 14 of Jeremiah 7. Therefore, I will do to the house, which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to this place, which I gave to you and your fathers, as I've done to Shiloh, and destroy it. Just like he destroyed the, t uh, the temple, the temporary temple that he had in Shiloh, I'm going to destroy it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So Jesus is quoting them the same curse that Jeremiah pronounced 700 years earlier. You've turned this house into a den of thieves, and so therefore I'm cursing it. So Jesus is coming in and saying the same curse to them. Now, right before this, he had just cursed the fig tree because it was pretending to be this full of fruit and all this stuff, and there was nothing on it. It was a fraud, and so he cursed it. And then he goes into the temple, and the same thing's happening, just fraud. Nothing is happening but fraud. So he's cursing it with the same curse that Jeremiah gave. Uh, and then Jeremiah, verse 8, in chapter 8, I'm sorry, verse 13. So one chapter later, as Jeremiah is laying out this whole curse, which I won't read the whole curse to you, but it's that den of thieves curse, and I'm going to curse it. He says, I will surely consume them. This is Jeremiah 8, 13, part of the curse that Jeremiah's predicting is going to happen to the temple, and it did. The temple was destroyed. He says, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be in the fine, on the vine, no figs on the tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things I've given them shall pass away from them. So no figs on this tree. There'll be no figs on the tree. Nothing's going to grow again. So when Jesus is cursing the fig tree, he's not just upset because I was hungry and I didn't get nothing to eat, and I'm really pissed. He's, he's giving the curse that Jeremiah gave. No figs on this tree anymore. And that's and because you're not doing what you're called to do, because you're a fraud, you're not doing what you're called to do, I'm cursing you. Then he goes in the temple and he gives that curse, that same curse that Jeremiah gave. And sure enough, that's what happened. The land dried up, the temple was destroyed, etc. So in Mark 11, verse 20, when they come out of the temple, the next day, it says, now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. So Jesus pronounces the curse, and now they're seeing the consequences of the curse. They're seeing the curse enacted. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus is saying, see, how, see what happened to this fig tree and how there's no fruit on it. Therefore, I've cursed it. The same thing's going to happen to Jerusalem. Yes, you're now seeing the fig tree has been cursed and everything's dried up. So he pronounces that same curse in the temple. It is interesting about the fig tree, why God uses the fig tree. Why does he use the fig tree? When did we first hear about the fig tree? When was the first mention of the fig tree in the Bible? Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit the fruit of this tree, and she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now they're, they are disobeying God. God says you can do anything you want, eat of any fruit, but do not eat of the fruit of this particular tree that will be disobedient. 
don't do that. That will be you deciding to reject me and reject what I am saying to you. And you're going to be your own gods and you're going to do your own thing. Don't do that. Verse seven, the very next verse, it says, and then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings. So the assumption is this was a fig tree. Mm -hmm. Their eyes open. And, and so the fig leaves has always been any, uh, a metaphor for you trying to cover up your sin. Mm -hmm. And, and so he uses that same metaphor in Jerusalem. Jeremiah uses it right before the temple's destroyed. Jesus goes to the fig tree again and say, this is emblematic of your sin, the same fig tree, the same fig tree. It's the same thing. And so I'm cursing it just like you're about to be cursed. So in Matthew chapter 24, and, and, and so Jesus gives a parable before any of this happens. He talks about this fig tree that the master came and saw and there were no leaves on it. And he says, it's been three years now, three years that I've come to this fig tree that I mean, yes, and there's been no leaves on it. And that's like three years I've showed up in Jerusalem and there's been no fruit. Matthew chapter 24. Uh, this is the next day. No, I'm sorry, it's the same day. Matthew chapter 24. The same day. It says, then Jesus went out, verse 1, and he departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus, and they're going, oh, isn't that pretty? And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, right across from the temple, the disciples came in privately and said, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? When is the temple going to be destroyed? When, when will all these stones of this temple be thrown down? So that's the question that Jesus is answering. He's not answering any other question even though we tried to make him answer another question, that's what he's answering. When will this happen and will be the sign of your coming in judgment? Matthew 24, verse 6, he tells them, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. This is, these are the signs. When will you, when's the temple going to be thrown down and all the stones be smashed? And when is it going to happen? Well, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end's not yet, not quite yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And all these are just the beginning of sorrows. Now, again, all of this happened during the 40 year period between the time Jesus was crucified and 70 AD when the temple was thrown down. <coughs> there were earthquakes, there were pestilences. We don't talk about this history a lot. Now, I'm skipping to Luke 21 because the next thing that Jesus said it's said better in Luke 21. It's plainer because Luke's writing to us Gentiles. Luke 21, 20 says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, in Matthew says, when you see the desolation of, spoken of by Daniel, the in what desolation, what are you talking about? So Luke just says it plain. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. So two things have to happen. There have to be earthquakes, there have to be rumors of war, there has to be pestilence, famine, all that was happening. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, which happened in 66 AD when King, when Emperor Titus sent an army to surround Jerusalem, know that its desolation is near. Now it's just about to happen. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter. Get out of Jerusalem because it's about to be destroyed. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Everything that you've heard about in the Old Testament, it's all going to be fulfilled at that point, although he didn't call it the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, now back to 24, <clears throat> verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree that I just cursed. Remember, I just went and I cursed the fig tree and withered it because I was man. And then I went into the temple and I told them that, say, I pronounced that same curse that Jeremiah pronounced right before the temple was destroyed. So learn this parable from the fig tree that I just cursed. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near, right? When you see, uh, that, that's how you can tell, oh, okay, it must be summertime because those leaves are sprouting and the fruit that should have been there should have been there, right? So the same metaphor, like just like you knew, like you can tell when the summer is approaching, she says, so you also, when you see all these things, Know that it is near. It's at the doors. 
the destruction is just about to happen because that's the question he was answering. When is the temple going to be destroyed? Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So he's explaining to this generation about the destruction of the temple. That's the only thing he's talking about. That's the only question they ask. That's the only thing he's answering. And the metaphor of the fig tree, he's, he's using it again. Just like you can tell the seasons, just when you look at the fig tree that I cursed, just know that's all about to happen. People, for some reason, I when in the 70s, when I started to hear about the end times happening in my lifetime, which is a new teaching, because for... 1900 years, 1800 years, they believed that the, end, that the end times that Jesus was talking about happened in 70 AD. But this new teaching came up this past century that says, no, 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 Jesus wasn't talking about that generation. He's really talking about our generation. Even though he said this generation, he didn't mean it. He meant our generation. They said that when Jesus is talking about the fig tree, He's talking about the blossoming of it and how Israel's about to become a nation again. And that happened in 1948. And I'm thinking, now that I've read the Bible, no, he's talking about the cursing of the fig tree and the, and the withering away of the fig tree. And, and he was cursing the fig tree. That wasn't anything positive at all about Israel. It was all negative. So, but I bought it and I believed it. Oh yes, when Israel becomes a nation again, that's what Jesus was talking about. Nope, that's not what he's talking about. And he's explaining, you'll know when this destruction is coming, just like you can look at a fig tree and tell the, the, the season is coming just by the blossoming of the leaves. You'll know when this destruction is coming. So don't be stupid. So back to the parable that Jesus was talking about the fig tree in Luke chapter 13. He's talking about the master came three years in a row the vineyard keeper came three years in a row, right, to check on it. And then he says to the keeper of the vineyard, verse 7 again, Luke 13, verse 7, then I'm done. He says to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered, verse 8, and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also. Just give us a little more time until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. So he buys a little bit more time. I know it's been three years, but I need six more months. And then if there's nothing, then I'm cutting it down. So Jesus, this is at the beginning of the six, the last six months of Jesus' ministry. He's gone three years, three years he's gone to the temple, but he's coming back. And in six months from this time period, in March, he's going to go back to Jerusalem go back to the temple and he's telling him exactly how it's going to happen he says the person asked for like just give us a little bit more time and then if there's not if you find no fruit then I'm going to cut it down well I already fast forwarded to Mark 11 to Luke 21 he does show up he finds no fruit and he curses it but he's warning them in advance what's about to happen so so the, during the six month period I'm going to be preaching Every day during this era, I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead. You're going to see miracles like you've never seen before. But if there's no repentance, if Jerusalem just refuses to repent and receive its Messiah, then judgment will come. And there's nothing that the curse will be pronounced. And just like that tree is withered up, Jerusalem is going to wither up. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Because again, all of this that Luke is, this is the last six months where Jesus is warning people and every parable he gives <clears throat> is about the judgment that's coming because he really wants them to repent. He doesn't, God doesn't want judgment to come. That's why he sends all these warnings all the time. Blinded eyes, crazy thing, miracles that you've never seen before are, are going to happen in this last six month period on purpose because this is their last chance. If you don't believe this, then you won't ever believe anything. You're just purposely blaspheming and denying the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing I can do to save you. Okay, so thanks for, the, for listening in. Thank goodness that 
we are those who believe. We believe. You say, okay, I'm not going to, I believe. I, I'm convinced. You don't have to do anything crazy for me. I'm there. I'm with you. And that's, that's where we are, fortunately. But it does behoove us to warn others that there is a judgment day. Okay, so I'm ending there. Thank you so much. I'm also teaching on Sundays um, in the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We're going through the Old Testament, but you can watch it at any time. It's going to answer my Facebook page, and I appreciate those who take the time to listen in. All right, I'll talk to you next week. God bless. Bye-bye.